Okay, let's wait a bit longer. So welcome, welcome everyone who is here to listen in and who is here to assist and who is here to talk. We are looking very much forward to an exciting uh, four hours that are about to come. We look forward to hearing what you guys are thinking and we look forward to hearing from other people. Um, on the screen right now, you can see all the wonderful sponsors of the Globinar. On the left-hand side, we have the people who are um, actually sponsoring, right-hand side, people who are contributing in kind by helping us to organize this really, really global event throughout the world over time sessions with input from the most incredible people ever. So we are still waiting a bit longer uh, as we have some more people who need to join before we can actually start. Passionate about use of photogrammetry for cultural heritage preservation. Thank you for introducing me. As a list, it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce you as my co or uncle. Azalis is from the University of Leuven in Belgium, and she's also passionate about built heritage documentation, innovation, international relations. Thank you very much now. Azalis, um, you're welcome. <laughs> and you're even more welcome now. So I think right now we move to the so, next slide, Michelle. Thank you very much. Ah, yeah, these are just some uh, some ground rules for for everyone. You will get back to some of them later on. Um, most of you don't have a right to unmute, but those who are, please mute unless uh, it's uh, your turn to speak and share information. Um, yeah, we kindly ask you to use your real name um, in in your Zoom uh, account, just so we know who is there. Um, and as a, yeah, especially because we're in a specific time zone, we do want to mention to everyone that we are uh, recording this webinar and we will later on post it also on our YouTube channels. Michelle? Great. So now I gladly give the floor not to Mario, but to our dear colleague Haifa. Yeah, thank you, Azelis. Uh, actually, thank you. Um... I'm happy to uh, to do the opening remarks. I will read from the paper, but because we, we have a plenty of like thoughts and ideas that come from our hearts and to make it in order. And so I will write and read it. So on behalf of our World Heritage, we welcome uh, you to our third event this year and the second webinar for the transformational impacts of information technology theme. One of 12 monthly debates on World Heritage issues that will be held throughout 2021. Our World Heritage uh, mobilized, uh, uh, mobilized a group of citizens and professionals to renew and reinforce heritage protection for the next 50 years. In addition, building a global network to include as much of civil society as possible. Our World Heritage 20, uh, 2021 monthly debates aim to raise general awareness about the significance of our World Heritage, natural and cultural sites, and critical pressures that encountering uh, from increase uh, are encountering uh, from increasing the pressure by unsustainable development activities climate change and instability among others and to foster opportunities for inv the involvement of society civil societies in funding innovative sustainable solutions so for further information please visit our website which is ourworldheritage.org Today, we are in the third event and the second webinar. The IT team opened the debate by the first, uh, the, the first webinar that took place on the 9th of January this year, and it was wonderful 23, 23 hours long amazing marathon with more than 120 speakers and panelists and 900 participants from all over the world. This has allowed us to expand our global network of organizations, professionals, individuals, to exchange ideas and, uh, and aspirations. On February 6th of this year, we had our second event titled Moving Forward Innovation Tools and uh, Told Stories in Our World Heritage, 
and the main aim for this event was to announce the nine shortlisted consistent uh, contents of the 36 submissions for our competition. We also took the opportunity to share the feedback on the policy recommendations report from the first webinar discussions. And we also revealed the first time, for the first time, the initial concept, the toolkit or the hub, like uh, as we wish to have, which are going to discuss it. We are, we are going to discuss it in this webinar and in a more so, and also in the future for in a more focused group. Today, we will have four sessions where we'll be bring to your hands update on the policy report, the concept of the toolkit, as well as a panel discussions breakout rooms in three key elements of the toolkit, capacity building, monitoring and interpretation tools, and data management, hoping to develop the to a toolkit we can put in heritage practitioner hands that harness information technology tools for better future of our World Heritage sites. On the closing event, we are gonna announce the winners of the competition. And here we were to mention how much we highly appreciate all the 36 teams, times and effort for the, uh, that they put in this, for this competition, sharing their ideas and their expertise. And of course, we thank the industry partners, Capturing Reality, Cento, Olicidari, Time Luber, Word Sensing, and Zoo Frontlich, who generously offered prizes for the competition. So on behalf of myself and our coordinator, Christina Cameron, and uh, our co uh, and my co-convener, Mario Santana, I would like to thank you, uh, to thank uh, the tireless work of our team, of uh, our team and welcome us, uh, welcome you today to our event, to, uh, to our glo second webinar today. And we also invite each of one of you to get involved with us in other activities and debates of this year. We look forward to hear your invaluable ideas and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haifa. Uh, Michelle, can you uh, guide us through the next slides, please? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, here with uh, a kind reminder. So at a certain point in our session, we will move to breakout rooms where we want to hear all of you in more smaller groups where we will talk about uh, four different teams. So capacity building, tools for monitoring interpretation, data management, and we have for you, especially today, one Arabic breakout room. Uh, we kindly ask you to choose one panel and put in front of your Zoom name the number of the panel that you would like to attend. So this is already um, a kind reminder. We will uh, get back to this point later on. Michelle? Thanks. Um, yeah, throughout the day, you will see uh, we have <coughs> special software to present um, the presentations of our speakers as well as during the breakout rooms, the software is called Myro. Uh, you can see in the link, Joe will drop their uh, link to how you can actually access Myro. You will be asked to shortly uh, sign up with your email and give a name, and then you will be able to join us live into, it's basically a big whiteboard where everyone can drop post-its, questions, look at videos um, and actively join the discussions in the breakout rooms. This is a little bit um, how the Miro uh, user interface looks like. So you will be able to um, add sticky notes with questions. You will be able to add comments to anything that is being said uh, throughout the Globinar today. So we are all about open uh, communication and co-creation. Please drop us messages. Uh, we welcome it very much. Uh, so you can already see the link in the chat that uh, Joe just dropped there. Um, but we will also remind you about it uh, as soon as we get to the breakout rooms. Thanks, Michelle. Great. Um, so before um, we go into the thematic keynote, so for you today in this session, we are very happy to, to introduce you to our three uh, thematic keynote speakers. But before we do that, uh, we would like to ask all of you who are with us today, so we're already at 40 participants, uh, a small question. Uh, just to get a little bit of feeling of the room and to understand who is here with us today. So to do that, uh, we invite you to just um, click the link uh, that you see in the chat. 
And uh, basically what we would like to hear from you is where are you uh, joining us from? So we have uh, one person from Belgium, people from Beirut with us. Great, more people from Beirut. <laughs> Cool. So I think it's really nice to see uh, that our session two indeed covers the kind of the regions that we were hoping from. You see Paris, Turkey, Germany, some, some EU countries joining there. Nicosia, this was kind of uh, expected. Cool, we still have people um, from um, the first uh, session with us. That's always nice to see. Good representation from Jordan. I wonder if uh, Hi-Fi has anything to do with it. <laughs> Great, um, cool. Even United Kingdom is with us. It's always nice to hear. Portugal, Ghana, cool. Okay, so we have a little bit of an idea as to um, who is with us here today in the room. So as you can see, we cover uh, quite a large uh, geographic area. So that is bound to give us interesting discussions. Uh, the second question that uh, we would like to ask all of you is um, why did you come here today and which topics would you like to hear about and discuss about today? So again, it's a uh, very open question. It's just to get a little bit of an idea as to who is in the room and what you would like to hear about. So far, the teams on the screen, they are definitely looking okay. I think we will try to cover all of them. Transnational, definitely like it. Yeah, good. Sites, data. Wow, cool. <laughs> I'm trying to follow. Many data sharing, definitely something that we should cover. Conservation launching community, something let's please try to remember it at every point of our discussion that communities and world heritage sites, that they should be central in everything that we do. Young, I like the idea, young. It's intergenerational. I see the word generation. That's good. Let's keep it local, intergenerational. Visionary. Yes, I do like it. We, Na and me, decided to call our session where World Heritage meets innovation. So the word visionary definitely fits with what we are trying to achieve here today. Cool. I'm also screenshotting this because it's a, it's a very nice workout. I like it. Linkages. Dare, thank you. Perfect. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle, and thank you all for uh, dropping us some ideas as to what you want to discuss today. I think we are a great bunch and we all want to discuss uh, interesting points. So now, uh, Michelle, if you can kindly move us forward. I said kindly, so <laughs> let's try to uh, stick to the good atmosphere. Um, again, for those who joined a little bit later, uh, what is new in our Globinar is that you have the opportunity to book yourself a one-on-one -on -one speed networking date with some of our experts. Um, if you follow the link uh, that Joe will drop in the chat, you can see who the experts are with whom you can book a date. We have a great variety from you from different parts of the world and on different expertise. So go ahead and book yourself a date while it's still possible because the slots are limited. The dates will take place at the end of our session. Great. Michelle, I think now it's about time that we are uh, moving to some more content and start talking uh, with our uh, thematic keynote speakers. So if you can go to the slides. So um, today as anchors, so my co-anchor Na, uh, we, we decided to have two main topics for the keynote speakers. The first one is transboundary collaborations. And basically what we want to hear from our great keynote speakers is how can collaborations between countries and regions aid or improve the conservation and management of world heritage sites? So uh, collaboration between countries and the regions. There is many things that can be done there from capacity building to networking and exchange of knowledge and resources. And we will, we will hear all about it in a bit. And Culture and nature linkages. We are interested to know how we can bridge nature and culture when it comes to the issue of managing world heritage sites. We are also interested to know how digital tools can be used to aid this process. We would like to brainstorm, why is this not happening? And what are the good practices out there? Yeah. 
So I think next slide, please. Michelle, please, the next slide. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's this one. Go, go back, go back. Nah, you have to introduce the speaker. Na is going to introduce uh, the speaker. So go ahead. Yeah, so I have the pleasure to welcome. I have the pleasure to welcome Francesco Bandarin. Francesco is hey. You have a problem there. Is the former yeah. director of our World Heritage. Yeah, now we are having a bit uh, now we're having some connection problems. So yeah. He's going to give us a first keynote speak and his challenges, opportunities. Francesco, you have the yeah. floor. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think there was a problem with the with the uh, with the audio, but uh, you know, I think you, you wanted to introduce me as Hello. a. Yep. Can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you wanted to introduce me and. Uh, let me just uh, do it myself if you, <laughs> because I don't think it was very clear. I was for 18 years at UNESCO, first as director of the World Heritage Center and then as ADG for culture. Uh, so, you know, in those 18 years, I've been, you know, somehow exposed to many situations, uh, including uh, this very interesting case of uh, transboundary nominations. Now, because I have a very few, very short uh, talk, a very few minutes, uh, let me just say very quickly a couple of uh, facts. Um, first of all, all, Transboundary nomination, I, I would actually rename it into transnational nominations because transboundary is a sub case of, <laughs> of uh, is a special case of trans transnational. Transnational covers a broader field, or even of, of sites that are not contiguous, whereas transboundary are, in fact, sites that are contiguous. So we should call them actually transnational. So when they are transboundary, we can specify. They're all obviously serial, serial sites because there's more than one site. Now, I did a count. Uh, yesterday, maybe <clears throat> wrong, but I don't think so. And there are 36 uh, of this type in the World Heritage Convention out of 1100 and plus. So something like 3% <laughs> or, or even less, actually, <laughs> less zero 3%. Um, so it shows that, you know, this category transnational has not been very successful, just to make it very bluntly, you know, it's, it's been, a, you know, uh, in spite of being at the core of the spirit of the convention, because, you know, transnational nominations are the ones that foster cooperation, international cooperation, which is the main goal of the convention, you know, only very few, in fact, have come to the forefront. And this is a big issue. You now, some, that's something, some, something somehow we have to be redressed in the future, or we should be more of these sites in, them, you know, in order to fulfill the spirit of the convention. Um, in, there are cultural and natural, about uh, uh, 15 are, are, are are natural and 21 culture. Uh, and I would like to show you in these first minutes some of the key models of these uh, uh, transnational sites uh, with their successes and failures. And then perhaps later on when we have a discussion, we'll talk about cooperation. Now, the first um, uh, slide shows a failure. This is the Kogurio tombs um, uh, sites uh, in, uh, in, Ch in China and North Korea. And this is, these are exactly the same sites because they are, these are the tombs of the royal families of Kogurio uh, kingdom, uh, which is a very, very important kingdom uh, in the, uh, from between the first and sixth century uh, after of our age. And they are the same thing and it's essentially the same architecture and the same construction, but they are in two different countries. So we pushed them you know, to sort of carry a, a trans, transnational nomination, but it was impossible. You know, no, they didn't want and, you know, in spite of, you know, insistence, you know, China and North Korea said, no, 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 we'll go on our own way. So we have a site which is, in fact, the same site divided by a border. That's a failure. Next slide. <coughs> and, and, and there are several of these failures, I, I must admit. This is the model that we pursued as a uh, World Heritage Center. We backed very much this idea of having a transnational site inscribed as one site. Well, this is the, possibly the largest uh, one site, you know, transnational nominations that exist because it's the Camino Inca, the Incan Trail, the Capacanyan, which covers six countries. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, not in very good relationships. Sometimes there was even conflict during the 10 years that it took to 
uh, concoct this uh, nomination um, with uh, really, really hundreds of people involved and almost a million dollars invested by you know, the, the, the World Heritage Center through you know, donations, of course, you know, to, to have this. But at the end, we succeeded after 10 years. The site was described as one site. So this is the largest one site uh, transnational nomination, which forces the countries to cooperate very, very, very strictly. But it's a very difficult model to pursue. And so I'm not saying that this is the only one that we have to pursue. In fact, it's so complicated that, you know, the generally transnational nomination of large size are done in a different way. Next slide. And the model is uh, the one that we have uh, um, developed for the Silk Road, uh, which involves essentially the Central Asian uh, countries, uh, which, in, in, which is a completely different one. We essentially establish one um, kind of a overarching model. Uh, and of course, there is a cooperation between the countries, but each one is responsible for its own inscription. So it comes when it comes, you know, it's not, a, <laughs> so it's a serial nomination that, you know, comes a long time. And, but so far it's been quite successful and a few sites have come as start appearing on the thing. So I think that this is perhaps more feasible because countries like to work on their own. And so we have to somehow protect the cooperation model, but they cannot force countries to be in the same pot <laughs> all the time. So at the same time, because it's a very costly operation. Uh, similarly, and then the next, uh, there is a, a very interesting project called the Roman Limes, the borders of the Roman Empire, uh, which, as you know, have been already inscribed in the heritage list because we have the Adrian Wall and the uh, Antonin Wall in in, uh, in the UK and some pieces in Belgium and Germany. But you know, it's, at the moment, it's only in the northern part of uh, of the Limes or the, or the borders of the Roman Empire. So I think it would be very important to now start a co an international cooperation to inscribe sites also in the southern part of the uh, because. The, by, by the way, they are you know sometimes even more preserved. You know, and in the the northern fortresses of the Roman Empire were made of wood, as you can see on the left of the picture, uh, and, and of course they disappeared. They were else the other ones in the Arabian deserts are still there, and you can see them exactly as they were two thousand years ago. So, as you can see, there are different models, different ways of addressing the issues, and I think that we should be flexible on this in this defining the model because you know, each member state is different, and 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 sometimes regional cooperation is not possible because of difficulties or, or, or sometimes even conflicts uh, so we have to be flexible but certainly this is an area where uh, the convention has to be more active because it really is at the core of its uh, original spirit yeah thank you very much I, I, I hope i've been in within the five minutes yes 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 we are running really short on time uh, thanks uh, michelle you can go to the next slide in in the meanwhile so, so thank you very much francesco i think indeed this idea of the serial nominations be it uh, trans serial or trans boundary they are a very interesting model when it comes to talking about uh, trans boundary collaborations but as you say it is a cooperation model with um, benefits but also barriers or bottlenecks uh, let's say um, could we ask you how how would you or how can we ensure a longer term sustainability of such collaborations between countries? So not just uh, interest. Well, of course, there is. First of all, there must be a political will. That's the first thing, and secondly, there must be some advantages. Huh? And advantages are clearly on the exchange of experiences and perhaps even in getting some resources. You know, so very often, uh, you know, transnational sites have countries that do not really have the the, the the resources for that. In one case, which I, I really think was very successful, the Struve Geodetic Arc, and there was an association. There was actually, a, you know, an organization that backed the nomination because that that arch had been already identified and they actually were successful in putting 10 countries in, you know, in the same, it's probably the largest number of countries in the Struve Geodetic Arc, if, if those who don't know, is are, are the remains of the first uh, scientific uh, measuring of the meridian of the earth uh, done by, um, under the direction of a uh, German uh, 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 astronomer, but in fact, in fact, he was working at the court of the Tsar in St. Petersburg, and he, you know, in the 1860s, you know, decided to measure the meridian of the Earth with, with the triangulation, with the trigonometric triangulation, which is an enormous, <laughs> and so, so he needed to put a, lot, a number of, you know, um, places where to, to, to organize the triangulation, and, and some, some 300 of these, of these uh, 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 still remain, and they are inscribed in the world, at least by 10 countries. Thank you very much, Francesco. So political will, resources, and setting up a good association. Thank you yep. very much. Uh, next slide, Michel. Our next key speaker is in the person of Mariana Coriana. She is the president of Es Galicia. Mariana's presentation will focus on transboundary collaboration 
capacity building. Mariana, you have the floor. Muted. Michelle? Mariana is muted. Uh -huh. okay. So thank you for your kind introduction. It's, thank you also for invitation. It's a pleasure to be here among all these friends and colleagues. So um, I was requested to address capacity building and networking, and I'm quite happy to see that uh, it's an area that is, has been, uh, it's rising and people are getting more and more involved in this area. Um, what, what we notice in the last years is that the courses are changing, the, the training is changing. Uh, before the capacity building and the networking activities that have been developed have been developed a little across the world, but we see that there was a tendency on uh, creating international global courses. And these courses, for example, I participated as participant, but also as a um, resource, pe resource uh, person in different courses uh, from different organizations. And uh, what, what we notice is that uh, um, we went from, for example, uh, international courses addressing and preparing people to work with World Heritage nomination processes, like for example, the one in UNITAR, the UNITAR series that was created in 2003 in Hiroshima, uh, Japan, and uh, uh, with uh, each year dedicated to a, a specific uh, area. For example, when I was there in 2016, it was about justification for inscription. But then we have also other types of courses as the international courses re regarding uh, concepts of world heritage and where we we uh, could also, and we are going to speak, uh, there will be other uh, colleagues that will talk about it later on, uh, the linking nature and uh, nature and culture uh, series also that, uh, 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 that is being developed uh, with the support of the Norwegian and the Swiss government. And it's quite interesting interesting because we we saw also an approach that uh, is very is very based on linking different concepts but also on linking different people and, and uh, with different backgrounds so for example this one where i participated in 2007 in 2017 in Horos, um, uh, norway during two weeks it was an, an amazing experience because we could uh, during this short period we we experienced different backgrounds and also different experiences Experiences. But then we moved also to uh, all this experience that has been developed by uh, ICROM uh, with the, the international courses that they have been developed uh, across the, the, the world. And uh, with, uh, for example, the one on management and monitoring in uh, China. Uh, and uh, this one in particular was quite interesting too, because it was dedicated to cultural landscapes and the people and communities and how to involve communities and the, the work that they do with the monitoring. I mean, not always thinking about monitoring is not always brought by uh, um, uh, top-down approach, but it can also be from a down-top approach. Next, please. But we also, next slide, I think, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Or we could see... Uh, I think one back now, Michelle, you went a bit too fast. <laughs> The internet, I'm not, okay, got it. Uh, or we also see uh, uh, this capacity building approach has been changing. Uh, now there has been more and more uh, an approach re related with regions, a regional approach. So we saw, for example, uh, the World Heritage Leadership, uh, be the slide before, please. We saw the World Heritage Leadership uh, has been having a, a very strong, um, Thank you. A very strong uh, emphasis on, for example, on this issue related um, with the, uh, uh, the, the training uh, with different experts. For example, we had, uh, and I participated as a, as a resource person, we had in the Nordic, uh, Nordic and the Baltic countries. The next slide, please. We had an approach regarding the region. So it was related, for example, with the north of uh, Europe. 
And uh, uh, it was quite interesting because there was represented uh, experts coming from all the Nordic and uh, Baltic countries that uh, participated. Uh, so it was very focused on a folk, uh, World Heritage focused persons to improve their capacity building. Or we had also, we have, for example, on the Arab region, the work being developed by the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage based in Bahrain that they have been working with ICOMOS with the strength of capacity uh, of uh, capacities of world heritage professional experts. And this has been quite good also because it uh, uh, also prepares uh, um, pr professionally uh, people to uh, uh, go on missions, but also to participate on creating and working on their nomination. Afri as we could see also in Africa, the Africa World Heritage uh, Fund that has been uh, uh, working on these last years very, very heavily on preparing. Uh, for the projects that have been um, with the uh, advanced dossiers and how to help them to prepare and to uh, submit those dossiers. So uh, the online situation this uh, last one year and a half has been positive on the aspect that we could also uh, create a lot of online courses. So you could see that uh, uh, especially the in Europe, but also around the world, in Africa, uh, there was one course uh, in English and another one in French, and it was great because it brought people from all different nationalities. And uh, during one full week, we managed to to give to these uh, uh, experts with the sometimes uh, more limited uh, um, opportunities uh, to uh, have. Uh, uh, training, specific training. Next, please. Uh, we also saw uh, uh, lately, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's already there. It's, it's, uh, it's coming, <laughs> Maria. Okay. Thank you. So we also saw a, an interesting approach on this uh, last two years, which was a, an approach related with the uh, local communities and going more to, uh, and working with countries. So for example, we saw um, enhancing capacities of world heritage stakeholders that was developed on the Republic of South Sudan, uh, which was uh, an, an amazing work that they are doing in very, very difficult uh, conditions. And uh, uh, when we were there for one week, uh, rep uh, a re representative from uh, IUCN, from ICROM, and from ICOMOS, myself, uh, we had we had to work uh, with difficult conditions, but more important, we, we saw the work that uh, the expert, local experts are doing for the peace, for, the, for granting uh, peace uh, on the site, uh, on, uh, on the country. And the, the, the World Heritage uh, process, the convention, and then the process is a unique chance to bring people together because we saw sitting on the same t table, a country that had a civil war, a very strong civil war, and they were sitting on the same table working together uh, from different factions and people for the uh, working together and it was amazing this is uh, the 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 possibility that the world heritage convention brings uh, to the to the people a way to work together towards peace too so finally we also see the nominations that are being worked for example in algeria recently uh, uh, working of, towards uh, um, pre preparing local experts for tentative list proposals and just did this one three week, uh, two weeks ago and it has also immediately we saw a good result so all of this to say that besides the capacity building we also have the networking activity that it's fundamental to strengthen the capacities of people the resource people and this was developed in by icrom in uh, uh, 2018 in uh, Rome, Italy, and uh, it helps uh, 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 sharing experiences also to most important to be closer to communities and to be able to have a transfer of knowledge on both ways because we both learn from each other too. So finally, um, regarding the way to ensure the trans transboundary efforts, uh, it's, um, it's very important uh, so that those transboundary efforts respond to the needs of local people. And the way to do, do that is 
also to address capacity building that has to adapt. It's not the, the people that have to adapt to the organizations. Organizations have to adapt to communities and to, to people. And this is possible, for example, from going to global international courses to regional and local community courses uh, with uh, adapted to the local communities. Thank you. Okay, uh, ah, okay, <laughs> there was another slide, but, but thank you very much, Mariana. Um, um, I think maybe because we're uh, a bit over time already, uh, we will definitely get back to these points with you in a breakout room, I'm sure, later on. And if people want to hear more about it, Mariana will also be available for a one on one uh, expert networking at the end of our session. Uh, so, Michelle, if you can uh, move two slides uh, forward. But thank you very much, Mariana. I like the idea of organizations have to adapt to the communities. This is something that should be stressed. I think now. Our third, our third key uh, keynote speaker is Rin Alatulu. Rin is the vice president of ICOMOS. Her presentation will focus on culture, nature linkages. Rin, you are most welcome. Thank you. I'm very much honored uh, to participate at your event. And I will start that uh, ICOMOS and Europa Nostra, we have great news. We just released European Green Paper with Andrew Potts as a main author. And it is a response to European Green Deal uh, that addresses the climate change. Um, I recommend everyone to read it uh, also for capacity building, uh, what you addressed here before. And because if you need to discuss ecological footprint of the renovation of building lot uh, or how relevant it is to include heritage in protection, heritage protection in climate action, you will find perfect arguments. So I really recommend it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rene. It's indeed a very important document. Okay, M Michelle, can you go to the first slide? And, yeah. and Rene, uh, we're very happy to have you here, but, but try to stick to the time a little bit because yeah. we're running yeah. short. Yeah. For such a short intervention, I chose a bit less evident pillar of climate actions. It's uh, supporting uh, community-based prioritization and documentation of the effects of structural changes uh, that impact on losses of traditional livelihoods and other elements of cultural significance. Of course, carbon footprint of renovation of the buildings is a question of nature, but today I will end up talking about respecting natural and cultural heritage as a resource, significant also in climate neutral activities. Nature and culture are linked in almost every heritage sites, uh, cities with the green areas, as you see in, in Tallinn with the green belt. Uh, the next slide. Uh, Please. Uh, palaces with their parks where foreign and local species might have luxury growing conditions. The wooded meadows, one of the tentative list uh, sites for world heritage. Mills and rivers, even industries with their quarries. Uh, the next slide, please. The connecting link are human beings, the communities and their priorities. We know well that the responsibility for world heritage lies on states, municipalities, and communities. The relation between cultural heritage and nature protection authorities differ state by state. They can be collaborative or there can be complete ignorance for the other side. An example is the definition of the term environment where we get trapped by adapted different meanings. Environmental impact assessments are undertaken on World Heritage sites. However, it frequently disaggregates cultural heritage attributes and assesses impact on them separately. A more holistic approach to the site is required that involves nature, culture, and communities. However, holistic approach is always sensitive to holes. None of us is an expert of all values, especially as the values are in everlasting change. Next slide, please. Uh, with um, such complex issues, uh, one of the best tools is rights-based approaches. Uh, the aim of it is to identify all interested people and authorities involved, put, uh, but with a focus on local, uh, locals and uh, local communities. It is to discuss duty bearers and right holders. Talk to people is important, but
but it, in our digitalizing world, this is not enough and the digital tools are of great help. Next slide. I picked as an example, uh, sacred nature sites in Estonia. They are not listed as world heritage. Many of them are not even listed as national heritage, but I'm convinced that every precious site should be addressed as world heritage by locals because this is their world. Sacred natural places exist in different parts of the world and have generally much in common. The concept of sacredness can be connected with most different natural objects, trees, stones, springs, etc., depending on the local natural conditions. And they also have high natural value for the rich and untouched biodiversity. The example here is the cross sign trees. In Southern Estonia, there is a living tradition of cutting a cross sign in a tree trunk during the funeral procession to restrict the spirits of the deceased to return home and grant them peace. These sites are extremely sensitive to change for the natural as well cultural values. Here, the natural values are often easier to understand, while cultural values are more community-centered, often not fully noticed by outsiders. The legal protection may not just be over-restrictive, but it may destroy the spirit of the tradition. However, in recent years, we have had several scandals that while broadening the roads, several cross trees have been cut down. To avoid such disasters, a huge study is ongoing on sacred uh, natural sites. Scientific study in archive is however not enough. There must be ways to make it handy, to avoid explanation. We did not know, it is not our field or expertise. That's why it happened. The key element is the registration of objects uh, on national geo data. And Estonia has for several years developed an infrastructure for spatial data to combine and share data from different sources between different users. It is an X road to different information, starting from cadastral information up to geological data, and majority of it is accessible to everyone. In any planning process, I think it's it's, it's, it is obligatory to consult the geodata and take a note of potential conflict of values. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next slide, Michelle. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we also still at uh, this slide. I don't know if you want to mention. Yeah, I, I was planning to answer your question with this. Ah, slide. okay, voila. But, but I uh, thank you very much already, Rin. I think the points that you mentioned are good. I also like the case. So I think it is definitely uh, setting the tone also for what comes later, what data we need to link certain bridges and how we can connect them. Um, but maybe yeah, the question that, that we wanted to ask you is, uh, th there is already quite some examples um, out there, of course, on how to bridge uh, nature culture also using digital tools, but something that we often encounter, can you shed some light on how can we ensure that these efforts are really centered on the needs of local communities, so also what Mariana was mentioning before. Yeah, I was thinking about this question too to say that white space approaches coming back to this theme is aiming on the balance between different interests and consulting duty bearers and right owners may be time consuming, but uh, such multi-layered databases like I showed you can be of big help because they enable the dialogue. And it is quite easy to insert the data for the listed monuments, but it is much more difficult to forecast values that we are not aware of. And the examples on this picture here is uh, archaeology. What you see on the slides is actually uh, predicted uh, heritage. We don't know if it exists there or not. But uh, our archaeologists have tried to, to word uh, what a potential archaeological site can, can look like. And, um, and uh, they have also shared this information on this geodata with all the municipalities. And, and other people. And it is evident that the recognizing an archaeological site is difficult even for a specialist. Then how can a farmer recognize it behind the wheel of the tractor? Thus, uh, this, uh, this is a, a new way of uh, digital work. 
And that, the same goes for other types of heritage. What we value from the past and present is in constant change. Us, the heritage people, are expected to notice what may be of value for the future generations. And lastly, I would end that with ongoing this digitization and overload of information, people get more and more casual in searching information. One, thus, one has to be careful of the attitude. If you are not on the map, you are not there. Digital community is a new type of community where it is also important to see that nobody is left behind. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I also really like this last message. Uh, <laughs> if you're not on the map, you're not there. This is something that uh, we all should try to avoid at any cost, of course. So, um, yeah, on behalf of both Nai and myself, I would like to thank again uh, our three keynote speakers. I think we heard a lot of interesting models when it comes to transboundary collaboration, either through the capacity building or uh, mechanisms that are already in place when it comes to uh, serial world heritage nominations, which really endeavor, of course, a cooperation between countries, as explained by Francesco. Uh, what we definitely want to take home is the idea of um, yeah, using multi-layered databases to connect certain kinds of data, either between nature and culture or just across borders between regions and countries. But always, um, like Mariana and Rin definitely stressed, uh, make sure that the local communities are there. We don't want anyone left um, from the digital map, uh, basically. So thank you very much again. Uh, now we move onwards. Uh, Michelle, if you can move exactly. Thank you.